annual Radical Democracy Conference. As you can tell, this is our third year. Um, we started three years ago before I was actually a student here, um, although I did attend. It, we came out of a class taught by uh, an SSR professor, Andreas Kalibas, and a Columbia professor, Stathis Gurgudis. And yeah, we're really excited to have everybody here. Uh, we haven't quite decided what radical democracy is yet, so hopefully this year we'll get closer. And yeah, our first panel will be chaired by Professor Julia Ott here at the Musical Historical Studies. And yeah, take it away. Well, hi, good morning, everybody. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you in particular to the organizers, um, especially Edward and Sarah. Um, we've done such a wonderful job organizing conferences. It's really a hard thing to do. There's so many wheels that can fall off the train. I don't know what metaphor I'm trying to make here. But the point is they've done an excellent job, and I've been very impressed. So it's a great pleasure to introduce this first panel on radical democracy and economic justice. We're going to hear three marvelous papers this morning um, and have a, I'm sure, um, stimulating discussion um, and question and answer session afterwards. Um, so our first participant is Chris Tallett from Brown University. His paper is entitled Economic Justice Through Radical Democracy, question mark. Um, and Chris is a graduate student in political theory at Brown. Um, he received his bachelor's in political science from John Hopkins, and he's interested in questions of radical democracy, political economy, and social justice. Our second presenter today comes to us from Columbia University. His name is Simon Martin. Uh, his paper is entitled, the, Econo the Politics of Economic Democratization in the United States During the Great Depression. Simon has asked me to uh, pass out uh, a handout for all of you, so if you could distribute that while um, I'm finishing up my introductions, that would be great. So that's for his presentation. And Simon comes to us, as I said, from Columbia University, where he is a visiting scholar at the Department of Political Science. His current research, which is funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation, focuses on democracy during the Great Depression in both the United States and in Europe. He earned his PhD um, recently at the University of Basel, and he pursued his MA studies at the Universities of Bern and Bologna. Um, Stephen Polk is our last participant, or last presenter. He comes to us from um, UC Denver, UC, University of Colorado, Denver. His paper is entitled, The Necessity of Prefigurative Politics in an Age of Crisis and Collapse. Um, in addition to being a scholar, Stephen is a 10-year um, experienced activist, organizer, and, uh, uh, and during the anti-war demonstrations of the uh, early aughts, Stephen was first introduced to the practices of consensus, folks councils, and other forms of radical de democracy. He's been very involved in Occupy Denver um, and the up-and-coming community-produced agricultural project. He received his MA in 2009 from the University of Colorado at Denver, as I said, and where he now lectures in political science. Um, lastly, we have as our discussant our own Nicholas Fiore, and Nicholas is a student here in politics, a PhD candidate in politics, and the director of debate at Eugene Lyon College, which is a wonderful thing to be doing. His work on terrorism and visual politics connects ways of seeing with the conduct and consequences of war by combining a rigorous dedication to empirical research with a passion for the theoretical. So. Um, Again, thank you for coming, and we'll begin with Chris Tallett. I'm just going to go in order that they're listed on the program. So we'll begin with Chris Tallett. Again, his paper is entitled Economic Justice Through Radical Democracy. Question one. Okay. Hello. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. I, I really look forward to being able to, to meet many of you, and I hope to learn more about the work that you're doing. And I especially want to thank um, our chair and our discussion for reading our papers and for making this panel possible. So what I want to do in this essay is ask, can the terms of cooperation in the economy be open to actual consent um, for justice without jeopardizing that value there, but possibly even strengthening it? So could we, could we actually work towards justice in the economy through democracy um, 
without worrying about whether or not democracy is somehow going to subvert that value, but possibly even make it stronger. And I think this leads to two questions. So the first is whether collective action around justice in the economy is even possible. So I guess it would be irresponsible of us to um, expand democracy um, into a new realm like the economy if um, we didn't have maybe some evidence that there's groups in existence that would take advantage of their political rights and liberties to pursue justice in that context. And I think this is also a particular question for radical democracy because of the way in which radical democracy takes seriously our present context. And so I, I'm kind of inspired by what um, Last Tomasin says in Tondra and Tomasin's volume in which, he, in which he states, quote, any radical politics will have to start from the present order of things and take it seriously. The notion of heterogeneity gives us a way to think of a form of radical democracy um, a form of radical democracy in politics that does not take the limits of the present as its ultimate and fundamental horizon of possibility. Radical politics is not the art of the possible, but the art of making possible what is impossible in the present. And so I think that if there is some evidence that there are these kinds of groups in the economy, um, then we can ask what their implications are for justice and how we might engage with them um, to build justice in the economy. And I'll argue that by looking at some cases um, um, that this is possible. It is possible to expand actual consent in, into the economy for justice. Um, and that justice in the economy requires something that um, I, I want to call a micropolitics of justice to make it work. Um, if, if, um, please take issue with that if you think that that's not the right way to, um, to, to phrase that. But in any case, um, I have three jumping off points to kind of open up my analysis here. And they're represented by um, three different thinkers. So Rawls, Habermas, and Chantal Mouffe. And so first, Rawls, um, I think that Rawls shows us um, um, why it's important to care about equal citizenship. Um, if we care about equal citizenship, then I think we're caring about something like justice. So he cares about this kind of ideal. But I don't think that he takes seriously what's re what might be required for um, stability for his idea of justice in the economy. So people don't um, agree to the difference principle. Rawls doesn't really seem to care. On the other hand, if there was like a movement out there that was like persuading everybody like that the difference principle was um, the best thing ever and that everyone was agreeing to it, I, I don't think I'd have much of a question. But fortunate, but that's not happening, and I think it's kind of a good thing that that's not happening. So the second jumping off point here is Habermas. Habermas, um, I think, takes motivation seriously. So he wants to ground our terms of cooperation in um, the radical members of democracy, but it's unclear maybe where he where he goes with this, and so I, I, I think that still leaves open the question about where that might lead in the economy. Finally, I think Mouffe shows that well, democracy um, shows a corrective to Habermas as, as to why he he just might not be successful in this project because once we open the political up, there are these left right distinctions that um, are just part of the political, sort of like ontologically, and so Habermas is sort of just can't be right. So I want to ask. Um, um, how can we get to justice once we've considered these, these different jumping off points here? Um, how can we use something like radical democracy, take that seriously, but um, um, move towards justice, take ideals and motivation seriously also? So this brings me to my first point, um, which is um, having this some kind of requirement about um, that there actually be some groups that um, will pursue justice in the economy. And um, I really want to consider a hard case here. So I. I in, in this particular essay, I, I consider a couple of different cases in a longer version, but in this particular essay, I want to consider everyone's um, favorite group of crazy people, which is the Tea Party, and, and suggest um, how we might engage with them. Um, and so why should we care about a group like you know, the Tea Party? Um, I think that we need to um, pay attention to what they're doing because, in, in some respects, they are powerful. So out of 63 seats won by the Republicans in the 2010 midterm election cycle, 42 of them went to candidates closely identified with the Tea Party. Um, that doesn't even count um, Senate races. You know, Rand Paul might run for president and all this sort of stuff. So they've been able to set the agenda. Um, and there are, I think there are challenges to um, wanting to deal with a group like the Tea Party. I sort of narrow these down to, on the one hand, um, sort of this like leftist, liberal, popular critique, and on the other hand, there's sort of um, an academic critique. The first one I associated with this guy named Mark Lilla, who writes this article called, called The Tea Party Jacobins, in which he basically argues, and the same with sort of Matt Taibbi's articles, um, which he basically argues that the Tea Party is really nothing but a group of like 
completely nihilistic, angry, crazy people um, who believe in nothing, right? Like, so this is basically what this critique boils down to. And I think that um, that raises important problems for justice if they're actually powerful. It means that we have no way to engage with them um, towards a value like justice. Scotch Paul, on the other hand, argues, well, they do believe in something, um, but it's like they're Republicans, or they're an interest group. They just believe in what Republicans believe. So I think this also raises problems for justice if they're just an interest group. I mean, they might come to power, and you know, th there's no real obvious implications for justice there. And finally, um, there, there are, there's a great deal of evidence for, um, I mean, both the racism and the influence of money um, in many people associated with the Tea Party. And I, 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 I want to take that seriously. And, um, and these points you know, clearly have a basis in truth. There's many examples of that. Um, and yet, I want to come back to the point that they've still been able to set the agenda in important ways. So they've been an important group. Um, but I think the question that I want to ask here, is there actually any kind of evidence that they might be um, in any way um, a group acting um, on behalf of an idea like justice? And so for lack of a better way of putting this, I say that they could be seen as having um, relevance for justice in two different ways. They might have something like an explicit <coughs> politics of justice, which I think comes out in just things that they say, um, but like sometimes the media might ignore that, especially if you've ever you know, watched Chris Matthews like interview a T-Barrier. It's like, you know, they usually just get shouted down, maybe they deserve to be, but I think you know, maybe that doesn't get us anywhere. So um, it's really interesting to hear what tea Partiers will say if you ask them about justice, or like talk to these people. Um, so for example, um, I asked somebody um, um, the question, um, what does it mean to have justice in the economy? Um, the answer, quote, equal opportunity, not necessarily equal results. Taking from one person and giving to another is not justice, but providing people the same opportunities, that's what justice is all about. Um, and also, it's kind of weird, like, there is kind of a meme in a way of social justice that, like, moves around the Tea Party, Tea Party events. Like, speakers talk about it. Glenn Beck held, like, a three-part series on the idea. Um, so there's something there that that's, like, that's having some kind of resonance. Um, secondly, there's some kind of emergent politics of justice at play, for lack of a better word, I call this an emergent politics, um, in which there are strands of thought or, or lines of flight that could go either way. And this comes out of concerns that um, Tea Partiers express about the Constitution. They're very concerned about consent. And also, um, reacting to the economic crisis. There's just something about, there's something there about um, proportional or disproportional treatment um, um, that's, that's motivating them to, to act. Now, I think there are problems with, um, thinking about these two different ways in which the Tea Party might be a relevant movement for justice, right? First, with regard to the first, you know, the explicit idea, um, there's, the, there's a question about the meaning of what they're saying. I mean, they could just be crazy. Many of them seem to be very crazy. So it's like, do they actually have anything that means has, has any real meaning for justice? I think that's a fair, a fair critique. Secondly, there's sort of what I want to call, um, with regard to the, you know, emergent idea of justice, there's something that I want to call, for lack of a better word, the Glenn Beck problem, which is just that um, yeah, there are these emergent maybe ideas in the Tea Party, but there are these skillful rabble rousers like Beck who are really able to um, you know push those ideas towards something like fear um, or racism. Um, and I, I state in my paper um, the success of, of his show suggests that his message finds residence re sorry resonance in an audience. Many Tea Partiers were part of the, the audience that drove Beck's popularity, and he spoke directly to many of their themes and concerns. He was able to connect to the way they thought and use that resonance to make an argument about social justice they're more likely to accept. So this this leads me to the question: It's like, what do we do if we care about justice, right? So you got the Tea Party. It's like. They're, they're kind of powerful in certain instances. Like, you definitely care if you live in one of those districts. Um, on the one hand, um, there's some real problems with them. On the other hand, you know, maybe in some ways it could be a movement um, for justice. And I, I think this is where I think um, uh, Professor Connolly is, is in, incredibly helpful, um, because I think he shows that through something like micropolitics or arts of the self, it's possible to change our minds and to open ourselves to the possibility of new rights and being more pluralistic. And um, as Professor Connolly explains, this tends to come from something like arts of the self, and that combined with some kind of micropolitics. Now, I, I take micropolitics um, um, to mean um, something like engaging with people about abstract ideas like justice on the level of belief. Um, I'd be interested to know um, if, 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 you, if you guys agree with that characterization. Um, but. Um, in Why I'm Not a Secularist, Willem Connolly um, describes micropolitics this way, quote, self-artistry affects the ethical sensibility of individuals in their relations to others. Micropolitics helps to shape an intersubjective ethos of politics. Consider some macro-political proposals. Let's allow gays in the military. Let's grant individuals the right to doctor-assisted suicide, um, and so on. And then later, um, he says, if you think of public proposals and legal enactments as the molar politics of public officials, much of its preparation occurs through the molecular movements of micropolitics, end quote. 
So my question here is, can we use something like micropolitics to help move us closer um, to justice? I think that um, Professor Connolly shows us how we can use something like micropolitics to become open to new rights, which can help us to um, build an ethos of, of, of pluralism, a stronger ethos of pluralism. And I, and I just want to ask, um, can we somehow use that to help move us closer to justice? And I argue that, in fact, yes, yes, we can. And I think we can do that by um, engaging with groups like the Tea Party, even in a hard case, um, on an explicit level, on an emergent level, and that doing that requires recognizing um, the indeterminacy of political beliefs. So I think I think um, Mouffe explicitly broaches this last point um, in which he argues that there are indeterminacy in the kinds of chains of equivalence, like these social movements that she describes, um, that affects you know what, what they believe. And I really want to link that to micropolitics. Um, and I state it this way, recognizing indeterminacy can be seen as opening up a world of possibilities limited only by creative thinking and political arts of the self with the aim towards finding a way to knit a quilt of justice out of what is available, not waiting for the perfect plot. Most liberals see Glenn Beck and fear that the end of the Enlightenment is finally upon us. A different reaction would be to examine closely how his ideas resonate with diverse constituencies, attempt to tease out the instances of explicit and emergent politics of justice where they are only just becoming, and develop these by engaging with these diverse constituencies towards an end like justice. And this, to me, I think leads to you know, the key point. And it's like, fine, there's, maybe this is micropolitics, um, if, I, if I have that right. Um, but how is it like a micropolitics of justice, specifically? So I think, in a way, this is where, like, Rawls, like, comes back in. But I don't want to, like, bring him back in in any kind of strong sense. I just want to, I just want to pay attention to a concern for free and equal citizenship, which might be constituted in the economy through a standard, like, um, 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 equality of opportunity. So Rawls, I think, argues in favor of the difference principle, you know, because he thinks it realizes something like this. Um, I think he just isn't able to do that because he doesn't take seriously our actually existing conditions. However, but I, we, I think we can take that particular standard seriously, but how it's constituted will depend on our micropolitics. And so taking this approach is what I want to call micropolitics of justice. Um, we're able to engage an abstract idea of justice on the level of belief by constituting that standard in the way that we engage with each other. And I think that the benefits of, of this approach is that um, it can win more motivation towards some standard of justice. So um, it's stronger than the difference principle because it can win a kind of stability grounded in politics and not in kind of like predetermined ideas that people might accept. So just as kind of like an interesting aside, like <laughs> there's this um, weird idea of, uh, of Agenda 21 that floats around like Tea Party movements and they'll talk about it and you're like, what, what is that? They're like, oh, Agenda 21. And it's basically this uh, UN resolution that was passed like in 1992 which like makes every Tea Partier freak out that every like city council you know, legislation to enact bike paths, like the UN coming to take over. Or well, sort of like, they're afraid of having this preconceived idea coming in and imposed on them, and it can be similar to justice. They're afraid of having a preconceived idea, which leads them to, like, reject anything associated with it. So that's kind of what I want to try to avoid in the realm of justice. So, and I, th so I think it's stronger than the difference principle because it can win a kind of motivational stability, um, and it might be better, for our, better than just arguing for equality because it has a deeper normative grounding. Cool. All right, and I've got two minutes, so I'm not too far out of time. Um, so, what are, so this leads me to my third and final point. What are the implications of this? Um, I think the implications of this are that justice simply might not look like what we expect, right? And so just to take like a, a brief example, you know, um, leftist activists um, might want to, to um, build an idea of justice grounded in um, more redist redistribution for more equality, maybe more entitlements, but they might find that there's just no emergent politics that supports that. And I think that leads to the question of, of, of what you do. And I think that leftists might need to engage with groups where they're powerful, like the Tea Party, on their level of beliefs about justice that are grounded in weird things like the Constitution, um, patriotism, sort of like these hard work, um, middle class values, to make gains for important questions of justice like accountability for Wall Street and other questions like that. And I think what this might lead to, and I think the outcome of this is that the implications of this are two things. That it can't be planned in advance, and secondly, that it's likely to change what we think about justice and change our identity. So like in this in this endogenous kind of process, <coughs> through engaging with um, interesting and diverse um, groups like the Tea Party. And I think um, what it means is that, like for example, with regard to the idea of holding bankers accountable, um, you know, if, 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 if we might find that the way that we do that um, is unexpected. So, and I think it's, it, it might even be more you know, market affirming than leftists would like, um, but that might come to be the way in which um, some standard of justice is constituted somewhere. Um, but I think in some ways this is already happening. So, um, you know, efforts to 
um, you know, buy locally and um, support, you know, local farmers and things like this are kind of market-based things that, you know, if people took seriously the idea of justice in the Tea Party, they could actually engage with them about that. Um, local lending is another initiative that is not too far off the radar of, of, of possibility for groups like the Tea Party. And I think the irony of this, too, is that, you know, groups like the Tea Party could find themselves... Um, situated in um, an anti-capitalist, you know, anti-global capitalist stance in some way at the end of the day. But I think it just requires um, not pushing those groups away, but trying to bring them together to try to figure out how you can constitute an idea of justice. So, um, basically, um, in conclusion, it's like Rawls, Habermas, Booth, Connolly, um, um, they kind of get us somewhere, um, <laughs> but or they, they definitely get us somewhere. Um, but, but, but maybe not enough alone. Um, and I think that, um, you know, overall it's about finding ways to move towards justice where fear might otherwise prevail. It also doesn't mean that justice in the economy is a world in which all good things necessarily go together. But I think it forces us to be honest about that and find different ways to fight for those things or find novel ways of linking them towards justice. So in a way, I think it's kind of a, it's like a choice between, you know, you know like trying to fight for justice or, or letting fear prevail. So... Thank you. <laughs> Next, we're going to hear from Simon Marti from Colombia. And again, uh, his title of his paper is The Politics of Economic Democratization in the United States During the Great Depression. And hopefully, you all have the handout that um, Simon has shared with us. Yeah, that was a great problem this morning. I hope you can read it. Anyway. So, good morning. Thank good morning. you very much to the organizers of this conference to make this possible. I'm very glad to be here to present my, my research paper and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. As you have seen, this paper is part of a more, of a more comprehensive project which analyzes the relationship between economic development and uh, democracy at the time of the Great Depression <coughs> in both the United States as well as in uh, selected European countries in the 1930s. So the leading question of this uh, research project, project is why democracy prevailed in the United States, but not in Europe, not in, in many countries in Europe, I mean. So uh, during the interwar period, uh, in Europe, 13 countries, which were uh, democracies at the beginning, uh, turned to dictatorships. But this paper focuses on economic democratization in the United States during the Great Depression. <clears throat> so, basically, democracy did not only prevail on the national political level in the United States, but on the economic level, you know, especially in labor markets, uh, in labor relations, uh, the United States experienced a economic democratization um, uh, during the effort fighting crisis, the Great Depression at the time. So my argument is that there exist modes of policy argumentation uh, based on a policy argumentation of the actors involved. <coughs> the actors, I mean uh, the labor unions, uh, economic associations, and politicians, government, which are based on economic interests and values, which shaped the policy claims on labor relations, and therefore explain the economic democratization which took place at the time. So therefore my theoretical framework competes with other approaches such as historical institutionalism, uh, Marxism and uh, approaches of class dominance. Method methodologically I'm working on the boundary between political science and history. So I'm analyzing uh, empirical evidence of the of, uh, archive sources, primary sources, uh, secondary literature on, on the period of the 1930s here. <clears throat> and using uh, a theory, a theoretical approach for analyzing this. So this approach, as I said, focuses on economic interests and values, such as role conception, which I define as role conceptions of the actors who were involved. I'm, I'm shortly going to refer to the hypotheses, uh, which, which uh, are part of my approach. So, the economic interest-based hypotheses think that, argue that the different actors, like for example, labor, 
or the employers have economic interests in a certain regulation of the labor market. So, for example, uh, labor unions have an economic interest to become more powerful in order to bargain with, with uh, employers on wages, on working conditions, whereas employers obviously normally have the opposite interests. When labor gains, they lose, but it's not that easy. So it's especially in, the, in a time of crisis when, when uh, purchasing power went down, Wages went because wages went down, all the prices went down, income went down, also for the companies. So I argue that there was that, that there could could have been the situation that there was an overall economic interest of government, but also economic associations, labor unions, to rise the purchasing power, purchase purchasing power in the United States. <coughs> uh, in addition, this is a this is a hypothesis comes close to the to a Marxist approach. It could be the case that actors fear that the consequences, the political consequences of the crisis, would would lead to a collapse of of, of uh, capitalism, and they see that limited labor rights could be a, a remedy to save the, cap the existing order, and therefore being ready to grant certain additional, certain new rights to labor. And in addition, the values, which are part of my, of, of my um, theoretical approach, are that actors might claim that th there is a need of a certain economic democratization to overcome domination and to achieve protection for the freedom from domination. Which means like, like um, Naftali, for example, he uh, observed that the United States, when, when the United States were founded, one important role conception was that uh, to, uh, to achieve freedom from domination from a king, from the British king, and the same can happen in the economic sphere. Uh, what, ha what happened at the end of the 19th century, when in the progressive era, when uh, during the time of uh, the enactment of the Sherman Act, to Senate, which, which brought for the first time uh, 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 antitrust legislation into the, into the American uh, economic policy. <coughs> So Sherman's, Sherman argued at the time that when we are not ready to accept a king dominating us, we are also not, not, uh, not ready to accept a king of transportation, <coughs> of, of uh, utility companies, or, or other uh, monopolistic uh, companies which were in place at the time, especially in oil, electricity, and so on. So, yeah, there, there is this idea of freedom, which has also a meaning in, in, in a, which has also a meaning in the economic sphere. And this, a part of the neoliberal idea of freedom, which means that everybody can just do what he wants, but meant in a way as freedom from uh, economic oppression, too powerful economic actors. In the same way, uh, I used the role conception of, of equality, the idea that there needs to be a certain equality, which is not the same as equality sometime, sometimes is associated with, with the more uh, like socialism, for example, but which means that the freedom of somebody can not go so far as to destroy the freedom of others. Therefore, it would result, this, this uh, conception would result in a kind of, of equality. So, the empirical part, which I had to limit to the, to the creation of Section 7A of the National Industrial Recovery Act, you find this section on, on the handout, which is like 
which was called later as the Magna Carta, Charta of, of Labour during the, during the New Deal and at the same time seen as the most radical element of the whole New Deal legislation because it, it, it brought for the first time uh, labour workers into the political arena to an extent which, which it was never before in the United States. So, analyzing the, um, the empirical, <coughs> the, uh, the sources, the archive sources, I came to the conclusion using the, the hypothesis. I, I mentioned before that, that there are mainly two reasons why, uh, which shaped this section seven. So the first was that business especially the, the National Association of Manufacturers, which was like the, the, one of the two big umbrella organizations of, of corporate America, together with the United States uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce. They were actually demanding bold government actions to stop the destructive deflation, deflationary spiral of falling prices and wages. So it was not labor or left-wing groups which asked for government action when, when uh, the Great Depression caused a huge economic crisis in the United States. They tried to ask, uh, to convince uh, Herbert Hoover, the president until uh, early 1933, to help, to, to help them, uh, yeah, to, uh, yeah, to, to stabilize the wages and purchasing power in, in the United States. But Hoover uh, was, was not uh, ready to, to help. He, he found uh, the idea of organizing, of bringing in the government fascist at the time, because uh, it was basically, he, he perceived it as exactly what Mussolini was doing at the time already in Italy. Things things changed with the with the new administration and the crisis even came in becoming more severe at the time it's very important to see the the motivation of, of the big business lobbies of the United States for asking the government to act it was it fits basically really with the hypothesis that that actors that actors need that actors are, are convinced that purchasing power needs to be uh, strength rise, rise, yeah, exactly. Thank you. <clears throat> so the problem is a single. There is a there is a difference between the interests of single companies and and uh, business associations. Single companies have no interest of stronger labor, more, and therefore more purchasing power because they are trying to pay for this uh, labor at the same time. But if the government steps in and, and uh, makes stronger labor uh, the law, every company has the same level playing field. So that was the logic behind, behind the business associations asking the government to step in. So as I mentioned, Hoover was not convinced that this was a good idea. Things changed later after Roosevelt was, was elected, and especially also in his administration. Um, most notably, the Secretary of Labor, Francis Perkins, was convinced, okay, if we, if we bring in the government, working together with the business associations, it, it has to be fair in, in the way that also labor um, will have a say. That was a very crucial situation because labor, as, as the predecessor of, of, of uh, Francis Perkins, basically ignored labor and labor's claims on, on uh, labor regulations for the research institute. But Perkins, Perkins really helped labor to, to have a seat at the table. And therefore, this section 7A was basically drafted, co drafted 
from late and also take your time. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> so as you might know, in 1935, like just two years afterwards, the Supreme Court ruled the Naira uh, unconstitutional. But it was anyway. Yeah, thank you. It was anyway. Uh, yeah, at the same time, yeah, thank you. at the same time, because uh, labor unions and the Roosevelt administration were absolutely aware of the fact that there was a very, was it was a very, um, was threatened actually by the Supreme Court. <clears throat> so they brought underway a new legislation, and labor was strong enough at that time because of sections, because Section 7A helped them to organize and to, to gain members, to, to have a search for membership, they were strong enough to carry on and to become self-reliable self -reli and backing new legislation, which secured the labor rights in 7A. And for, and for the first time, in 1936, Labour was strong enough that they could actually participate in a, in a presidential campaign, in, and, and uh, especially also financially, they could contribute for the first time, uh, <coughs> and supported, of course, Roosevelt because uh, because he was more amenable to their ideas. So my my research shows basically that. Contrary to a Marxist approach, uh, um, the labor movement was not strong enough in 1933 to enact 7A alone. Without the help of, of, of the FDR administration, it wouldn't have been possible. At the same time, as the institutionalized approach shows, the initiative didn't come from the did, um, contrary to what the historic institutions think, the initiative came from from business and not from from, from uh, the administration. Furthermore, business, contrary to what the class dominance-based approach finds, lost its power to determine labor policy after the, the initial demand for state intervention. So, until after the Second World War, the first time in the United States. Labor had a more uh, had had a better position politically and legally, even though it was under under pressure, and uh, this contributed also to to a, to a better economic situation of workers until the 60s. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Colorado, Denver. This paper is entitled The Necessity of Prefigurative Politics in an Age of Crisis and Collapse. Well, thank you. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I want to thank the organizers and uh, everyone for coming here today. I'm definitely looking forward to uh, the discussions that we're going to have. Um, I really do think <laughs> that radical democracy is a critical question, um, especially in the day and age when we're starting to see uh, not just a huge gap between economic inequality, but also political um, inequality. <laughs> Um, and uh, the ability of people to, you know, make change. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about, I think, you know, mostly in this paper is developing processes that <clears throat> enable people in their everyday situations and their everyday lives uh, to participate meaningfully and effectively in democratic process. Um, and to me, that's kind of a core of uh, the definition of radical democracy. Um, before I get into my paper, I do want to talk, uh, or like, yeah, uh, set it up a little bit. Um, <clears throat> one, I, I'm coming from an explicitly anarchist perspective. <clears throat> and um, so, you know, just so that the cat is out of the bag, as it were, I, uh, <laughs> it's coming from an anti statist and, and anti uh, capitalist perspective. Um, so, you know, when I get into discussion about, all, you know, creating alternative institutions, um, it's, you know, creating alternative institutions outside as much as possible. Uh, the existing uh, economic and political system. 
Um, and also, too, uh, the you know, anarchist scholarship is largely concerned, or the, the relationship between theory and practice and anarchist, anarchist scholarship is extremely close. Um, a, a huge you know, portion of anarchist scholarship is uh, over you know, questions of action in the present. Um, so, you know, what is the best way to proceed from here? Uh, what is an effective way to move from here? And also, too, what is an ethical way to move from here? Um, so means and ends in uh, anarchist scholarship and practice are uh, very important. So, um, yeah, so ethics such as horizontalism, um, mutual aid, and solidarity are essential um, in anarchism. And, you know, finding ways to actually act those out um, to give them form is, is really important. Um, so another starting point of this essay is that I contend that crisis and uh, collapse is eminent. Um, so it's not that you know crisis is, it, it is not a question of if, it's a question of when. Um, and as I thought about this idea of crisis a lot more, like I, I kind of make, or as a starting point, um, especially in the US, I you know almost state that crisis is not here in the United States. And I would say that that is true for a majority of people. Um, you know, we can still go to the store, we can still, um, you know, carry out like our daily lives. Unemployment is like at 9% in the United States. Um, but I just wanted to make a really quick note that uh, the experience of crisis is uneven. Um, you know, not only globally, but also here in the United States. Uh, so pe for people in the south side of Chicago, uh, crisis is not only here, but it's a way of life. Um, for you know, certain neighborhoods in Philadelphia, and the Ninth Ward in New Orleans, um, in you know, Los Angeles, crisis is a way of life. And this is in addition to the one billion people that worldwide that are living in slums. Crisis is a way of life. Uh, so I'm coming from a very privileged perspective when I'm talking about um, the fact that people in the United States have a, have a certain luxury of, you know, starting to create alternative institutions according to our own values that a lot of people don't have. Um, <clears throat> and while this isn't articulated in my essay, I do just kind of want to uh, give a brief trajectory of the ideas. Uh, this essay is a beginning. Um, it's, you know, I, I definitely want to develop this more. Uh, but it, and I want to put forward some two possible trajectories and I'm going to present them in the form of a question. But one, um, what is, or give me a second. Um, so, yeah, like what would, or so, so the, the, what, what are the end points of this essay is um, why aren't social movements, radical social movements, you know, anarchist social movements, putting forward uh, economic development programs. Um, and, you know, of course, there aren't a lot of anarchists or you know, radical um, activists or organizers. Um, so any such project would have to exist on an extremely small scale um, in terms of, you know, gardening projects, community gardening projects, um, you know, what to do with waste, um, how do we start, you know, really building healthy communities from an economic development standpoint. Um, and, uh, secondly, um, and this is kind of more in an ecological sense, like I am a gardener, it is one of my uh, biases. Um, coming from Denver, you know, it is absolutely like nowhere near the size of New York. There's a lot of open space. Gardening makes a lot more sense in a city like Denver than it does in New York. Um, but the question I want to put forward is, what is the power of a social movement that can feed itself from seat to table and beyond? Um, and, you know, of course, uh, you know, in a city like New York, they would have to rely on surrounding populations in order to feed themselves, uh, perhaps in some sort of like federative uh, relationship. Um, but you know, the amount of land that it would have to rely on outside of the, the city center is in proportion to its population or something like that. Uh, but these are sorts of kind of like the, the ideas that I want to start getting forward um, in this paper. Um, and then four, um, and this is, largely has to do with like radical activism, but like I honestly believe that, you know, the sorts of um, ideas that I'm putting forward in this, um, in this paper are not like a bourgeois kind of uh, self-help uh, disguised as, you know, revolutionary activism. 
because um, I will be putting forward a concept for radical democracy that largely depends on personal development, that depends on um, you know movement development in that sense. Um, and secondly, nor is it like calculating power analysis um, of an authoritarian vanguard looking to seize the state, as it were. So I just want to set those as two parameters that the idea of putting forward is is not necessarily you know uh, revolutionary sense of you know communist movements or um, you know other socialist movements that you know were, were vanguardist, um, nor is it a sort of you know bourgeois self-help, um, let's change the world, but you know only change ourselves. So it kind of like moves in the middle um, of that. Um, so just yeah, that was to introduce everything. Um, but so I put forward a basically a debate that goes on in radical circles um, over this idea of crisis and collapse. Um, one side of this debate is that um, only crisis can, you know, create the, um, or could, could threaten people's material uh, interest and, and necessity enough to the point that they could uh, be, you know, motivated or mobilized towards fundamental revolutionary change. Um, and, you know, this idea relies on crisis. It says that, you know, there is no way that we can organize given the, the current um, you know, political, economic, uh, you know, cultural um, attitude in the United States. Uh, the only a crisis would even bring people out to the streets. Um, and perhaps it is that the, you know, the, the current kind of political and economic uh, regime um, that we're dealing with, uh, like global neoliberalism, if you want to describe it, uh, is so powerful that only mayhem, you know, could create, you know, enough cracks in the system that revolutionary ideas through. <clears throat> Uh, on the other side, though, the, the freedom to organize in a state of crisis goes down. Um, and as I will demonstrate, kind of using Greece as a case study, I would like to you know, study a lot more about the, the situation in Greece um, to you know, really talk about my analysis. Uh, but this other idea says that you know, given periods of relative economic and political stability, and remember when I said relative, right, because crisis is ongoing, crisis is uneven, um, but in these periods, uh, radical movements would, you know, be with a good use of their time. Would be to start to develop the uh, prefigurative strategy, um, and so this idea of a prefigurative strategy uh, is that instead of, or is that you know, creating some vision of a future society in the here and now. So uh, instead of you know, asking concessions from the government, um, you know, or asking corporations to please change their behavior. Uh, this sort of prefigurative activism takes it upon itself to uh, create, for example, a general assembly, um, as Occupy Wall Street did. But a, gen a general assembly is prefigurative, right, because it re relies on this form of uh, consensus democracy, radical democracy, or participatory democracy, whatever you want to call it, um, because it's how people want to like, live you know, in the future lives. Um, and you know, if we're serious about radical democracy, then we should probably start practicing, practicing it now. Um, and yeah, so in, in these times when we have the, the privilege to um, the, the privilege of, of economic and political stability, we better start prefiguring these you know future life ways. Um, but it is these prefigurative attempts, though, that act as ideas lying around that could be taken up and further institutionalized in the midst of collapse. Um, early neoliberal uh, Friedman uh, understood this very well, uh, and he states, and I quote, only a crisis, actual, per actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken up depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. So, <laughs> That's uh, you know Thomas Friedman uh, writing in idea too, and I want to point out that there's a distinct difference between the prefigurative approach adopted by Friedman um, than with, with this top-down strategy and uh, the prefigurative approach from you know uh, created by radical activists from the bottom up. Um, uh, Klein, in her book The Shock Doctrine, uh, comments on this quote. Um, and I quote, some people stock, pot, stockpile canned goods and water in preparation for major disasters. Friedmanites stockpile free market ideas, right? 
So for, you know, because Friedman, they have the, the backing of Pinochet and a brutal military dictatorship, uh, their prefigurative strategy largely looked like creating policy. It largely created, or largely relied on um, ideas lying around, right? Uh, for radical activists, they don't have, you know, the luxury, they, they don't have the power of a, a military dictatorship, right? Um, but, so their, their prefigurative approach has to be much more comprehensive. Um, and I, as part of this comprehensive approach, there's like two different parts. Um, and kind of at the base of this is this concept of radical democracy. Uh, but radical democracy, as, as I understand it, is not just consensus. It's not just, um, it's not just you know, participatory democracy, direct democracy, or whatever you want to call it, or a uh, spokes council, or a fishbowl, or any other form of uh, the process. Uh, but it is a way to build movements. Um, and it is a successful way to build movements. And um, I also want to state or, so, so that's one part of it, is uh, you know, going into any prefigurative approach, direct democracy is kind of the bedrock. Um, it, it's it's the, the method by which we get there or process. Um, and secondly, uh, the, the second uh, aspect of this is creating alternative institutions according to our own values, right? Um, so alternative institutions based on, uh, or ethics, I'm sorry. Um, you could call them values if you want. Uh, but ethics based on horizontalism. Uh, ethics based on mutual aid, ethics based on um, uh, solidarity. That, uh, yeah, that the more that we develop these, the more that, uh, the more comprehensive these approaches, um, the better off that these ideas will be taken up during periods of crisis. Um, so moving forward, I just want to state that, um, so I, I, I talked about Greece, uh, really, uh, or a brief, um, case study of Greece as uh, to, to bring to life some of the difficulties of organizing okay, in, in crisis. Um, and but essentially, I only have two more minutes, so I'm going to move through this a little bit uh, quickly. But currently in Greece, um, you know, the suicide rate is uh, upwards of 37%. Unemployment for youth is 60%. Um, unemployment in general, I think, is around 30%. Um, the rise of the fascist Golden Dawn Party at 10.7% approval rating is extremely uh, scary. Um, they're carrying out daily attacks against immigrants. And uh, the radical left, and specifically the non-electoral, so non-Syriza left, um, is having a difficult time organizing. Um, anarchist activists have been tortured. Uh, there's been a lot of time is dedicated towards anti-fascist demonstrations or like the fence of immigrant communities um, that you know Golden Dawn is carrying out attacks often with impunity from a police force where Golden Dawn membership is as high as 50 percent. Um, so the, the the basic idea here is that when when, when crisis comes, um, you know perhaps the uh, anarchist position in Greece would be much stronger. Um, you know, the, the more uh, prefigurative activism that they would engage in. And, and just to close out, I think that one of the reasons why radical democracy is so important um, in, in, a, in a radical context, in the context of creating alternative institutions, is because, you know, we live in this, you know, our so-called, like, democratic society, uh, yet very rarely do we learn how to meaningfully and effectively participate in democratic process. Uh, we learn how to vote. Um, which is a very you know passive act. Uh, we learn how to spend our dollar wisely um, in this you know kind of weird idea of economic democracy, uh, where we vote with our dollar. Uh, yet very rarely do we learn how to deliberate with people, um, with uh, people in our community. And radical democracy, in this sense, um, like in, in, in consensus develops people how to uh, participate in a very de social, like very developed um, and, and complex social skill. And uh, that is essential because if people don't know how to be free, um, or people don't know what freedom is, um, then, give me a second. 
is kind of a punchline too. Uh, but if, uh, if people don't know what freedom is, then they don't know how to be free. So if we're serious about creating democratic futures, we need to teach people how to act democratically. We need to teach people how to deliberate skillfully um, in order to take um, more control over their own lives. And yeah, I think that's it. So thank you. Our own uh, PhD candidate here at the New School, uh, Nicholas Fiore, who will be leading our, our, providing some words, 10 minutes of uh, comments to our discussion. Um, sorry, I'm just getting over a cold, so I'm sorry about my voice if it comes in and out. I'm trying my best. Use the microphone. I think it'd be loud enough, but it just might be kind of scratchy. So. Um, so, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Marty, Mr. Pope, and Mr. Talent uh, for their presentations. I found the discussions illuminating and original, providing us with a number of potential offshoots for discussions by thinking through their, uh, their arguments together. Specifically, I have a few uh, comments just in general uh, that I kind of was thinking about through this question of economic justice. These papers, I think, force us to consider the role of crisis for creating the conditions for radical democracy. And why it is that democratic <coughs> gains made during crisis times are often rolled back during times of non-crisis. Moreover, it seems clear that recent crises, economic, natural, or not so natural, have forced us to consider the relationship between neoliberalism and disaster. I want to pose the question of whether the demand for economic justice can overcome the structural forms of racism and the economies of disposability that make the demand for justice so pressing. If today, crisis is necessary for producing democracy, how can we sustain this, these movements once crisis subsides? so as to address the ongoing systemic violence that's occurring. Those kind of general comments. And I have some specific questions uh, that I kind of put together for the presenters. First, I'd like to draw the connection between Mr. Polk and Mr. Marty's pieces. In some ways, the argument that we need a prefigurative radical democratic institutions in anticipation of crisis aligns nicely with the arguments Mr. Marty makes that in fact crisis is the catalyst for change for an acting policy to contribute to economic justice or democratization. I wonder if you both would agree with seeing your arguments as part of the same sequence. Because at the same time, I could also see making the argument that those local practices that prefigure radical democracy to come would be wholly thwarted if not for the large scale policy making that can occur only in times of crisis by elites. Does this point to a deadlock between the macro and micro political of radical democracy or a potential opening? Secondly, I want to think about the possibility of imminent forms of radical democracy. Mr. Markey argues that what remains constant is the underlying reason why decision makers are convinced the labor market should be designed in a specific way. This is in this paper, attributed to that line. Exactly. I wonder if you think that crisis has the ability to change the decision making calculus ethically, economically, or politically for those elite decision makers, therefore changing the arguments or social realities that persuade elites to economically democratize, thus creating conditions for an emergent economic uh, democratization. Mr. Polk, while well, I take your point that in times of crisis, people turn to ideas deployed and honed in times of non-crisis, I wonder if there is still room for the emergence of an imminent form of radical democracy. Crisis, by its very nature, is unpredictable and can produce new and interesting forms of social organization from within. How do we keep open the possibility of emergent forms of radical democracy? And finally, Mr. Talon, your piece points to the potential for an alliance between the Tea Party and the left over issues of economic justice. This, to me, recalls a bizarre overlap between the far left that criticizes President Obama's use of drones as an overreach of presidential power, and libertarian Rand Paul's filibuster of John Brennan over his support for the Obama's drone policy. While the far left uh, and libertarian Republicans oppose drone strikes on Americans, they do so for very different reasons, and at the very least, each come with their own set of considerable baggage in tension with the other. I bring this up only to wonder about the potential problems of creating coalitions that agree on policy questions, but for very different philosophical reasons. I wonder if, it is, uh, if this is what you have in mind when we think of the new coalitions for justice, or does the intersubjective micro practices you mentioned produce some sort of new politics, uh, new alliances, uh, or new coalitions? That was a wonderful um, agenda setting for our session. So now I'm going to attempt to 
moderate the discussion, and I tend to get a little spacey and wrap up in the ideas, so hopefully it won't fail miserably. But I think maybe since um, Nicholas has done such a nice job of setting an uh, initial agenda for us, um, maybe I'll invite the panelists if they would each care to respond um, to his comments before we kind of open it up for a larger conversation. Would that be good? Yeah. Okay. All right. So whoever would like to begin. Okay. Um, so the the question, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, was two parts. One, crisis creates uh, more impetus and perhaps more creativity um, for deepening and perhaps extending mm -hmm. like radical democracy. Um, and then also the second one is how do we keep it open um, in order to in order for those possi possibilities to be you know, taken up. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's a really important point. And, and this is why practice is so important. Um, and I think this is why Occupy Wall Street was so important in reviving democratic, right, people's democratic imagination about the future. Um, is with, with, without actual practice, without these processes um, you know, getting teased out, without um, people understanding the, the complexities and also the difficulty of consensus. Consensus is, is difficult. You know, I want to make, I want to make it you know, absolutely clear that you know, I don't think consensus should be used all the time in every situation. It's extremely cumbersome, um, especially with large people, especially with people who don't really know each other. Uh, but there are other radical democratic forms that should be experimented with. And I think that unless you're giving one to them on the ground, um, unless you're practicing on they're just ideas. Uh, but through practice uh, and through process, you develop and, and learn not only the form, um, but also like as, a, as an individual, you learn um, a pretty highly developed like social skill of you know democratic deliberation um, and a participatory form. Um, and, but through through those processes, you also build movements. So yeah, I think to, to in order to keep them open, you practice them. And you Right. I'm a little bit, I'm not so optimistic that crisis always makes people more uh, creative in terms of finding more democratic regulations. I think, especially especially uh, my, my doctor project, comparing Europe and uh, the United States shows that in Europe you have more of the opposite cases, especially Germany, but also Italy and even countries which are not so well known, like Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland wasn't, wasn't was never seen as a dictatorship, but in the economic policy, it was authoritarian. It turned authoritarian during the during the crisis. So I that's why why I I tried to I, I tried to uh, use this. Approach of of finding of uh, economic interests and values to compare to be able to compare between between the, the different countries. And I think in the United States we have a special configuration of of economic interests as I as I uh, as, as I just before told you um, of of the business world, which they did not really want economic democratization as such. They just wanted uh, to, to rise uh, purchase in Canada. So it was basically, I think the democratization, which nevertheless took place here, was more the result of the kind of path dependency. And and uh, thanks happened thanks to the fact that that the FDR administration and especially Perkins were so much open to to, to unions. If for example Hoover would have been or, or another president you know, and another administration that said, okay, we are, we're trying to do this, we're trying to, to step in, to, to, the government tries to regulate the, 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 <clears throat> the economy, but not asking at the same time uh, labor unions at the table, it might have been different. So now I, have, I have to recall that the first draft of, of, of Naira was without Section 70, without without uh, this this uh, this only happened after Perkins saw the first draft, and then and then uh, stepped in and, and said we have to take labor at the table to, to hammer this 
this end. So I think, and then, it, yeah, so first, ironically, for, for the business world, uh, the act became different as they, as they thought at the beginning. And in addition, after Section 7A uh, came enacted, the search of membership uh, in the unions, and therefore the strengthening, the, the, the growing power of unions happened, which were happening, which was happening thanks to this, was path, a kind of path dependency, which was not, which was initially not uh, thought about. So, uh, but I'm nevertheless I'm not so optimistic about that. Crisis creates more necessarily more democratic. But also, as you mentioned, in the case of Greece, it's, it's not so clear. Stephen, did you like to get into the conversation? I'm sorry, Chris. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Thanks so much for your comments. I think the example of like leftist critics of Obama for his drug policy and other things like Graham Paul is a fabulous example of, I think, the kind of thing that I want to be talking about. And I, I also love the way you put that to say that like, it comes with baggage. Because that's totally true, right? And so like there comes a point where you might like unpack that baggage and instead of it's like groups don't like what's in the baggage, right? But for for a little while they share some of that baggage. Um, and I I want to answer your question and say that like I definitely uh, want to envision um, you know what I call micropolitics of justice, creating like a new politics, like a, a new form of justice. And I, I, I think I want to I think I want to see that having like an endogen an endogeneity between like the way those standards are constituted and the identities that people have. And like to take an example from like Occupy Wall Street, you know, I think it's like when Occupy reached out to like what otherwise are like traditionally more like conservative reactionary groups like the police or like the Marines and stuff like that, it's not like they were just like winning those groups over to their side. It's like now you're with us. It's like they were also like redefining what that movement was, which is I think one of the super interesting things about Occupy, which is that like like if you know if you went to those general assemblies I and mean, you might go in thinking like it was gonna be one way, and then you might come out thinking like, okay, something else, that's part of my movement too, you know, and I, I think that's definitely got to be part of it. So, yeah, I love that, man. That's I, I'm totally on board with that. Yeah. Uh, let's take some questions from the audience. Um, let's see. Here. Uh, would you prefer that they be batched or the question could be? Um, I think this gentleman in the back. Are we batching them? Are we batching? Batch batch I just want to know. Um, well, let's see. We've got some time, so maybe we don't need to batch at, right away. Um, so the gentleman in the back. Yeah, FDR, 33. Andrew Jackson, Hitler. There's a certain time when you can get elected, that you're elected for as long as you want, and you can do anything you want. Salazar in Portugal in the 30s, the last 40 years. Uh, Andrew Jackson <coughs> and FDR, my junior professor at Schlesinger, Coincidentally, wrote about both guys. Both, of, you know, Jackson. Get rid of the national bank. Get rid of the Indians. Let me fire the whole cabinet except them. Let me just do whatever you want. Uh, FDR was the same thing. The fact that it can go in a democratic situation—that's fine. There's <coughs> potential that it can happen. It certainly didn't happen. Salazar so didn't quite happen. So, I, you know, uh, and, and a kind of a tyrannical mentality, individual personality with Andrew ja Jackson. In other words, you can get a different result. And, and the fact, crisis, sort of crisis, you can almost make the argument that every election is a crisis, and, and that's what the candidate's really trying to tell you. But it does matter, I, I think, at, at a certain juncture, when you can look ahead, and, and if you really can have a, a, a sense of history and a sense of dynamics, this is the one I got to win this election, because this is going to just, there's nothing to stop me. I really have an open hand, and, and I can do whatever I want. I think that's an element that no one looks at. Uh, and FDR, I think it's certainly the case. I don't know. Would anyone care to comment? Or should we? Yeah, I think it's a good point. Okay, over here in the blue. Cool. Uh, thanks. That was all super great. My question is actually for Stephen. Um, so I'm super happy. That, like, I'm always really uh, enthusiastic when people are kind of trying to get things and kind of lost these in academia. Uh, the question I have for you, however, is I want to know kind of. So you have the specter of crisis running throughout uh, your talk and in your paper, and I wasn't quite sure. It seems to me there was a bit of ambiguity whether you're saying crisis is here now, or whether crisis is going to come. And maybe it's both. Maybe crisis is turned out for some people and it's going to come for other people. Um, but I wonder the question I want to have when Occupy was kind of brought up here is 
And then also, but Nicholas brought this up in a bit of his, uh, of his discussion of yours. It's not very clear to me why the specter of crisis can't be used in the exactly a retrograde way that you're worrying about. So to situate myself in Occupy as well, uh, in Vancouver, Occupy Vancouver collapsed primarily because of uh, an unbelievable amount of sexism that wouldn't be held accountable uh, because the specter of crisis was brought up, we'll deal with that later. And so it seems to me that argument kind of falls in line in the same way that you bring it up, right? Crisis is important, we need to kind of work it out because um, you know, if we don't uh, have this kind of people here politics now, then off the crisis we're going to be screwed over. But it's not clear to me why that same very argument and how you defend against the exact opposite of that, namely that you know we won't deal with issues of race, we won't deal with issues of sexism in a prefigurative sense, because there are more important, urgent issues right now because we're in a crisis. Right. <clears throat> I mean, it definitely could go that way, right? And, and I think one of the strengths of radical democracy is that you know through in insistence on um, you know non-sexist, uh, non-homophobic, um, you know, like we're not. You know, through, through insistence on an explicit anti-oppression uh, language and organizing, the you know it's in, in implementing that in your uh, practice of direct democracy, implementing that in creation of um, alternative economic institutions, um, and absolutely making sure that that is a, a part of what you are doing, um, that that is you know is an effective way of, of guarding against it. Right, um, and, and I think there that there are numerous other. Um, you know, pitfalls and, um, you know, and, and, and other ways that movements can, uh, you know, take on um, some of the more oppressive or hierarchical or, uh, forms of society and institute them perhaps even uh, more acutely in their social movements, right? I mean, I think that any social movement runs the risk of doing that. Um, so, yeah, that's why it's me, really like practice and process. Uh, and prefiguration is so important along these radical, egalitarian lines. And explicitly anti oppressive right? Others, yes. Um, thank you. Uh, just a very general, two very general comments and two questions. One very general comment, uh, I mean, I was struck that none of you brought up the question of exploitation. It's not a critical remark, it's just uh, when it comes to the, the question of economic justice, I think it's one of the crucial uh, concepts. And uh, I think also that it, in democratic theory, it recently it's been neglected. And the, the other general point, uh, maybe not, it's not so much applicable to Mr. Marty's uh, paper, you didn't speak much about conflict, and here is my uh, here are my um, my questions. Uh, Mr. Talent and Mr. Polk uh, were talking quite a lot about consensus and this and the deliberative decision making process. But in the when it comes to economic justice, um, I think that uh, I mean it's a question of division of scarce resources, right? And there you need to have a authoritative institution that will say um, that, I mean, it's a question of conflict of interest or maybe even more, right? I mean, uh, so it's a question of how to divide scarce resources or maybe not so scarce, but still resources so that we have the equality of outcome as well. Um, so, I mean, the, the question, is, I mean, the issue is that sometimes you have to force people to uh, give up so, uh, a certain amount of their resources in order to be able to give these resources to other people. And um, my question is, how would you, uh, how would, you, how can you achieve that, you know, the, the uh, equality of outcome, uh, when it, in the case of uh, alternative institutions that are um, <coughs> that are built on deliberation. Uh, uh, in the case of uh, Mr. Polk and in the case of Mr. Talent, uh, how uh, how can this be achieved in uh, uh, in this micro politics of justice? <coughs> and uh, I'm I'm here sp specifically referring to uh, d different policies, which are I mean I don't know red redistributive policies, uh, taxation, and so on and so forth. I. I assume that Mr. Polk is not very happy with the taxation because he is an anti-statist, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a general. Okay, sure. I, 
th thank you so much for that question. And I think it's a fabulous question because, yeah, there is. Um, it makes. I think it's important to ask about the role of exploitation and whether or not we're actually doing something about it. Right? Like, it seems like that should be something that motivates us to, to care about justice. And it's like presumably a reason why we're all scared about free equal citizenship. Right? Um, so. Yeah, I agree with you. The only thing I want to, I guess the only way I want to respond to that is just to say that, like, um, I don't want to assume, like, particular categories of exploitation. So I don't want to assume, like, classical Marxist categories of exploitation um, for, like, workers in the market or for categories like that. Um, I think all I really want to do is just say that we should um, be more attentive to what these groups, like, actually believe um, in order to understand, like, how they understand exploitation. Um, because it might not be um, precisely um, what we think. And as a result, it might open um, the new avenues to fight an exploitation. Like, oh, we thought initially this was just, you know, workers um, versus capitalists. And that's probably definitely part of it. Um, but actually, you know, it might also be something about, um, you know, like some kind of working conditions or some, like, new avenues like, oh, this is what these people actually, you know, um, um, what not being exploited would mean to these people. So we can actually better serve um, the ends of fighting against exploitation by, you know, engaging with people to find out what they actually think about that. And just regard, and with regard to, like, the rule of consensus, yeah, I, um, thanks for bringing that up. We'll definitely take a note of that because I wasn't really trying to, like, press the idea of consensus. I think I just wanted to um, press the idea of, you know, trying to find ways to <coughs> overcome that, le that strict left-to-right distinction so that we can maybe move <coughs> towards some idea of justice. But, like, I could definitely see that, I would definitely see that falling back on an idea of politics, like a conflictual politics or an agonistic politics. I mean, at the end of the day, not, yeah, you're totally right, not everybody's going to agree, but they have to be able to fall back on the idea that, um, you know, they can creatively try to engage again the next day. They can learn more about what other people believe in and find, you know, new avenues for engagement. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to say consensus, but like consensus in that respect, I guess. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, and, and I think exploitation and, and specifically like capitalist relations are absolutely necessary that we understand them um, in, in order to develop you know alternative institutions that you know, not only don't replicate those but um, you know perhaps or that, that you know avoid exploitation altogether. And like I know that's a very broad statement, um, and you know anarchists aren't necessarily uh, particularly like like well positioned to. You know, answer or critique. You know, some of the more um, finer points of capitalist relations. Um, so, yeah, kind of a non-answer to my question. Um, but it, other than to say that it's absolutely important, right? That it, that it is essential to understand uh, moving forward from you know an explicit radical perspective. Um, but I, and I'm not sure if I necessarily agree with the necessity of authoritative institutions um, in order to distribute scarce resources. Um, I feel that, well, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it's especially difficult um, considering that the current state of, um, like, global ecological systems is precarious. Um, according to more than a few, like, key ecological indicators, whether that's global warming or acidification of oceans, uh, lo loss of uh, you know, biodiversity and mass extinction, um, that perhaps we are past the point of return um, in terms of trying to remediate a lot of those. Um, and when we see, well, what we see the, uh, or w with scarce resources, the impetus for authoritarianism, the impetus for, um, uh, you know, all-out civil war increases. And so, I, I mean, that's just the reality of it, or at least how I see things going down. Um, and... So, if, if we're to really envision, though, a, a society of our own making, um, let's envision it and let's actually build right here and now institutions that are not authoritative. Um, there, there's, you know, and, and, and right now, like, at least in our, in our current position, I mean, at least for some of us, we can afford to be utopian in our thinking, we can afford to be utopian in our experimentation with alternative forms, um, and we should pursue that, and we should not, and we should be unapologetic about pursuing it. <clears throat> um, I, I just want to, to mention something to, to uh, your point of uh, why not using the concept of exploitation. I think somehow, uh, in my favorite, it has an important role because of the 
your conception of freedom, freedom from oppression. I think this pretty much also covers this because, and also also in the empirical part, and uh, for example, Roosevelt at the time he used very often the terms of economic royalists and uh, or money changers, which need to be counterbalanced by new legislation in order to avoid this exploitation taking place, like for example on the, on the labor market. Yes. Um, I have a question for Mr. Tallinn as well, and I think it goes into a similar direction, <coughs> but it's a common end question, and um, the comment would be, I have the impression that this whole setup of micropolitics of belief is too optimistic, because in the end, as an argument for the leftists to discuss with the member of the Tea Party, it would, it would work only if you have the premise that um, the leftist would win the discussion and um, thereby relying on a concept of discourse and consensus and truth which is quite Habermasian and you mentioned Rawls, Habermas and Muth in your like theoretical setup and I have the impression that in the end your thesis is quite Habermasian and I would ask <coughs> with Muth is this communicative rationality really appropriate and does it work? And that was the common and the um, impression that it's too optimistic. Now for the question, also a little bit relying on move. And what about macro politics, leftist macro politics? And this is, what about the notion of hegemony? And what about education? Um, should we not try to tackle the weird beliefs of Tea Party members on the level of more structural educational politics. Thank you, well, thank you so, so much. Well, I, I very much appreciate those comments, and I, I, I think I want to share those concerns. And um, maybe it is too optimistic, but ho I, my hope is that I can identify some kind of inroads that, that, that don't make it completely optimistic. Now, the question is like optimistic in regard to what? Mm -hmm. And if I. Um, I also appreciate the comments that you find um, my presentation to be um, um, very harmonic. That's actually not the direction that I want to go. So, so maybe I should do more work on um, um, avoiding that or figuring out how to lean into that direction without realizing it. Um, I think actually what I what I want to say is that. So I take your point well, which is that like if we really maybe if we really take the move more seriously, then these left right distinctions are more strict than I make them out to be. I was like I'm sitting here saying like. Oh, it's like we're just not trying hard enough. Like we can actually get this Habermasian outcome. Um, <coughs> so that's so I don't want to say that. What I do want to say is that we're going to be left with conflict. I think this goes back to the other question too, but I didn't make that nearly clear enough. At the end of the day, there's still going to be some conflict left. And we're not all going to happily come together and have this new idea of justice. Um, but I do think that like I, I actually want to draw on this idea of hegemony, like you mentioned before, but to acknowledge like very seriously the fact that um, this hegemony also. Um, it's like the left doesn't have um, um, doesn't have like ownership of that hegemony. So it's like there could also be like rightist forms of hegemony um, that don't necessarily fall strictly into the categories that like move mostly criticized. It's like you know Hader in Austria or like truly um, like strictly reductively xenophobic and exclusionary politics. Because to me like then there is a serious problem. Like then you do in fact have politics as as a form of war, right? In which like the leftist alternative would definitely be a lot better. But with regard to like presuming that the left has like a monopoly on truth, you know, and that I'm presuming that I don't want to presume that either, actually. So I want to push back against both of these. But I really love these these, these questions. So what I want to say about that is that like to me, the way I want to frame that in this essay is that like that's the whole like agenda 21 problem. For example, it's like it's just like precisely what Tea Partiers fear and like what makes them freak out and what pushes them in that sort of like exclusionary like xenophobic direction. So it's like um, if we go to somebody like a tea party and say like, you know, it's like really you gotta understand that, you know, structural forces are like screwing you over. They're gonna say like, I hate you, I'm never gonna listen to you. And and they're, they're gonna go they're gonna go like turn on Glenn Beck and like watch that all day, right? So I mean like um, I wanna say that, you know, um, it, instead of doing that, we should accept that like some of that confidence is gonna come with our own identity at the end of the day as well. Because we're gonna, you know, try to read something that um, they can overcome those exclusionary forces, you know, for some kind of like standard of justice. But yeah, I want to be way more clear about um, 
that's going to come with a lot of conflict. So I, I don't want it to be. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't want to like you know try to advocate for like some kind of Habermas you know thing here. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I would add another question. <coughs> I think the difference between uh, leftist movements and the Tea Party is pretty much that the Tea Party is a populist top-down movement, whereas left leftist movements or social movements are bottom-up. So that's a big empirical, or that's a problem of practice, right? So, so, um, so, I, so I don't totally agree with that, but yeah. Okay, right, go ahead. Another, another sentence. And um, I think the, the big problem is that those are two different constructions of social reality that are clashing here, right? So on the one hand, on the one hand, you have people who are in very powerful positions trying to create a movement that backs their politics, and that's exactly what Gramsci or Move and Laclau, following Gramsci, say. This is a hegemonic act, right? So. We can challenge that, we can try to replace that, but it will be extremely difficult to talk to someone who is so convinced <coughs> that he is living the truth. Right? So an example for me, like I come from I come from Germany. When I was in the States a couple of years ago, me and my ex-girlfriend, we went to a family libertarians. She said, don't talk to them about politics. I said, I have to do <laughs> so, so we were sitting after dinner, and, and I asked very, very kindly what, uh, what, what the father thinks about immigration policies. And I was super confused. In every bar, no matter if it's German, pizza place, Italian, Chinese, or whatever, you have people from um, Mexico working here. And you have, yeah, but you know, that's just the principle of capitalism. So we have to exploit people in order to keep the machine running. So how do you convince someone like that that he's completely alone? I love your question. Thank you so much. Maybe you can. You know, maybe that gets us off the radar. And to me, that's... Um, it, like, it presents a really nasty part of justice. In that case, like, yeah, I hope that the kind of you know, change of equivalence that MOVE um, supports would be able to overcome something like that. Um, but, and, you know, I'm, I'm, but there's no guarantee that um, that would necessarily be successful. So, and the problem, I think, that, that, you're, that you're kind of, maybe the main problem that you're identifying is just that, like, you know, the way you started your question to say that, you know, like, these guys are just, like, um, like, you know, corporate, um, you know, clones, um, and that, like, you know, on the other side, there's, like, this genuine, like, grassroots movement, um, and I do believe, and I do agree with you that um, it's not just one way or the other, so um, there's there's a whole lot of, you know, corporate, like, influence in this whole, like, Tea Party thing, I mean, like, there, you just, there's so many examples, you know, there's Koch Brothers funded organizations um, that, 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 that try to fund something that the Tea Party is doing and try to speak on behalf of that idea called the Tea Party, um, but once, but is also at the same time like undeniable that there are just like random people out there that kind of like lapsed onto this idea and just went with it, and they're doing stuff and they really believe it. And so, with regard to the fact that like you know they're like they're susceptible or that they you know they're. They, 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 they're influenced by the ideas that are like supported by Cooper, the front of organizations. I mean, my, my point is that like you just kind of have to take that seriously, and I, and or you have to take that belief seriously. And I don't want to get so I don't want to get into like um, the reasons why anybody believes what they believe. So I, at least I don't think I do. I just want to say like I just want to I just want to accept maybe a face value is like what you believe and then and then move from there. But what I would say is that like I, I do think that like there would be value to. Um, I mean, to, 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 to draw something from Habermas here that I think could be helpful, which is to say that, like, you, it, to the extent that these people do actually care about something, you know, um, that, that, that relates to justice, you know, once it becomes clear that, that, that um, groups that, you know, have been taught, that groups on the right are, like, you know, just funded by, you know, like, big, big money interests, um, you know, and if, 
and as a result might not actually care about the same values that they do, well, that does open up a new fissure. That opens up like a new possibility for engagement. Um, and that actually happens. I mean, like, these groups, like, generally speaking, a lot of them, like, I think Scotch was wrong in a lot of cases. Like, they don't like the Republican Party. They think it's just, like, you know, this, this big money group. They're, like, really suspicious of, like, a lot of groups that claim the Tea Party label because they're not speaking, you know, from actual consent of, like, individuals. They see them as, like, these, you know, big money groups. I think it's a problem, um, but I think it's still, um, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's something that should prevent us um, from trying to engage with so I feel like this maybe pushed a button back here in this area of the room. <clears throat> and maybe uh, it would be nice, if that's the case, if people want to um, continue to discuss this issue of the Tea Party and um, whether it is uh, should be understood fully as a top-down sort of puppet organization or not. Um, folks in the back of the sort of center back of the room there want to get on that. Maybe we can have a couple comments and continue the discussion that way. Or maybe people want to move on. Maybe I'm so anybody on that particular issue? So I guess this is addressed to, uh, thank you for all of your papers, I really appreciated them. And, and I guess this is a question that's a little bit more general, but I think uh, in some of the responses that you've given to some of the, the questions, it, it, this comes out a little bit. And then it's just like, there seems to be a sort of like self-awareness or self-evidence to what one's belief or interests or political commitments are, or at least should be. Uh, and I'm not entirely convinced that that's exactly that, that, that that's exactly the case. I, I, Chris, I thought that part of what you were arguing was that we figure out what it is that we want in the contestation over claims to justice. Uh, and I, I think something like that is what the, a general assembly enables as well. Um, so, but again, I'm not entirely sure that. You know, simply going in and talking to someone on the assumption that they already know what it is that they know, and that that belief is self-evident, secure, and uh, able to be rearticulated, right, uh, is such a is such steady ground for us to begin these kinds of engagements. Uh, I think we should take it as a, as a, as a benefit for the prospects for some kind of idea of justice in the economy that beliefs are not that way. So I, I definitely um, don't want to suggest that I think that um, people reductively know what, what their beliefs are. They might believe something, but I think that I mean, if something like a micropolitics of justice is going to work, it should take seriously the indeterminacy of all our beliefs. So they can go in different directions. So I, yeah, definitely. But that only makes the conversation a lot important. Exactly, yes. Yeah. I know more. Yeah. In the back there. Uh, I had a question for Mr. Pope. Um, I'm going to preface it with an anecdote from Michael Hart. Uh, and he talks about when he spent time with South American militants, and he talked, <laughs> and, and uh, he wish it. You know, he's talking to them about how enthusiastic he is about revolution in, in their country, and they said, "Well." Uh, why don't you make revolution in America? And he says, and he says, well, I don't. and they're like, well, do you have mountains in America? Get some guns and go up into the mountains in America. So Denver is a perfect place. <laughs> um, but uh, the, but the real thing that I was trying to get at with that, and he of course responds like, I, and so I went back to America and I said, this is not exactly. Well, we can't do this here. That that's his response, uh, and so his own theoretical project. Uh, kind of took off from there. But what I really want to touch on is something that uh, it comes up. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to this prefigurationist idea, this idea of the experimentation. But what I really wanted to use that anecdote to bring up is the idea that you use the example of Greece, for example. And, you know, here we're talking in, the, in Greece, Greece versus the United States. In the United States, we're talking about a population 30 times that heterogeneous, heterogeneous culture that doesn't have any kind of the, you know, uh, I mean, not to say that Greece isn't heterogeneous, but it's just the United States is such a diverse case. And so how do we take on this very localist with all of its uh, strengths, the, the strengths of localism, prefigurationist <coughs> program, with an eye to this macro level, especially in a place like the United States, where it's like five countries at least uh, in one place in terms of history, 
economics, and as you said, crisis is present, and as Clyde said, crisis is already present in the United States for a lot of people. Um, how do we, how do we, what do you think is the way that we should negotiate that, these small scale experiments with an eye to these larger problems? Right. And, and really quickly, the differences between the United States and Greece are uh, so diverse and, and so multifaceted. Uh, and my understanding of Greece is not as comprehensive as it should be. Um, with that said, however, and, and especially to avoid like any sort of parochialism, which I think these sort of like you know go local projects, you know, if presented in a certain way, definitely have a tendency to do. Um, you know, very inward looking. Um, you know, not comprehensive or not, you know, uh, in, in tune with other um, uh, movements or anything like that. I mean, absolutely should be avoided. And I think it, it should be avoided, um, like, through, you know, comprehensive global networking. Uh, we do now have the technology to do that. I mean, the internet, to a certain degree, is still a liberal toward technology. Um, and, and the fact that we can communicate with, you know, uh, you know, comrades, as it were, halfway across the world in real time. Um, so I think that in, in one of the values of, of the anarchist melee, melee uh, currently is its ability to network um, across different movements. So uh, my response to you know avoiding localism, to avoiding any sort of like parochialism or, um, or you know reversion um, to you know uh, previous impressions is through networking. <clears throat> This gentleman in the gray Yeah, I have a question both for Simon and for Stephen, which uh, can be linked back to a, to a historical situation. About half a century ago, one of the lecturers who was working here at the, at the New School was Günther Anders, who had left Germany as a, as a refugee. And uh, for, for him, one of the turning points in his own, let's say, um, career of thinking was coming across um, uh, Alfred Dublin's uh, novel, Berlin Alexanderplatz which made him question a lot of his own Heideggerian tradition of uh, being in the world and of questioning this very uh, expression of being in the world with regard to those who in uh, Berlin Alexanderplatz have lost the world. Uh, unemployed people like Biberkopf who were basically floating around without any clear position uh, in the world. Uh, and for him, for Günther Anders, uh, this referred to a very particular situation uh, because people who don't have a sense of the world anymore can also be easily exploited because they are usually well, taking up all the offers that are there, also very much in terms of resentment. And so I'm, I'm thinking of this particular historical situation of uh, Günther Anders' own effort of, of, of discussing this, this literary experience and, and to make it into, a, or to turn it into a political experience uh, in order to address also contemporary situations. I mean, we, I think we're living today in situations where we cannot trust anymore that there are actors like um, unions who represent the workers, uh, because in, in at least the European situation, and I'm more familiar with the European situation, you can hardly argue that there are unions that are representing the workers. If you, if you take the case of Greece, if you take the case of, of Italy or of, of Spain, uh, from the 70s onwards, the unions have been have been dissolved. You have massive um, situations and very different situations of, of a precarious existence. Um, and, and under these conditions, I, I wonder um, how how can you create situations where people um, are also acting under the, the promise that there is a world uh, that can also be theirs. Because very often, I think this is really an experience of, of unemployment at the moment, uh, especially unemployment also for young people, but also for elderly people, that they have lost very much this promise that there is a world. And, and I think this is also one of the very basic uh, preconditions uh, for, for democracy, a, a promise that there is a world. And, and so I wonder how would you, how would you address contemporary situations uh, of uh, precarization, of, uh, of unemployment, <coughs> where, we, where we don't find any, let's say, collective actor that is representing, um, let's say, people who are living and working under similar conditions. And also, maybe, like, to just interject ourselves um, uh, in, in the wake of that comment, um, which is to sort of push a little bit on prefigurative politics, because it seems to me that, um, I like this idea of you know, people who, who need to feel that they, uh, that an aspect of economic justice um, is a claim on 
the larger, a full participation of the larger world, and then not just a pre-conflict <coughs> politics that creates an alternative economy apart from that larger world. Um, and so my question is, what, the creating these alternative institutions uh, based on horizontalism, I mean, first of all, it seems to me that they're, they're very easily co-opted um, by uh, capitalism um, to become you know, sort of the latest fad and the latest thing. Um, but second of all, do they actually have, you know, going to this comment, um, do they actually have any capacity to change the larger structures of capitalism that put people in crisis and keep people in crisis um, quite intentionally? Um, and uh, some are better positioned to practice this prefigured politics than others. Um, so, and, and what we have, um, and crises are worse for some than for others, but what we do have, I think, is a, definitely a, so, a crisis of social reproduction um, in this country, at least, and probably all across the world. Um, and I'm wondering whether um, withdrawing into alternative institutions, which are then going to be networked by means of technologies which are produced under authoritative and exploitative conditions, um, whether that actually, um, you know, and then waiting for sort of, um, you know, I, yes, have them there, model them, show them to the world, um, but in the meantime, you know, what what is happening in the world and people's claims on living in that, or having the ability to live in that world, the, world, the only world that they're perhaps able to live in, because they cannot, they do not have the ability or the luxury to position themselves in these alternative um, prefigurative spaces. Right. <clears throat> um, so first I'll address the issue of capacity. Um, so, you know, do these prefigurative institutions stand any chance of actually uh, overturning some of um, the, the kind of exploitation endemic and social reproduction of capitalism? Um, and yeah, currently they don't, right? I mean, like the, the, these sorts of prefigurative institutions and, and even, you know, trying to conceptualize them is, yeah, I mean, like, well, let me back up. Uh, yeah, the, the people who are really, you know, pushing these sorts of prefigurative activisms, especially on, on a really small local scale, um, absolutely don't have critical mass to create any sort of like lasting change uh, on a macro scale, much less like a city like Austin, Texas, or something, um, which is where one of the examples that I bring up in the, in the paper. Um, and so many people describe them as being symbolic, right, as, as opposed to actually politically effective. And it's an important distinction because I think most prefigurative attempts right now are largely symbolic. Let's be honest, they're not going to you know, change the world tomorrow by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but it is to say that if these sorts of ideas of like a free future are not being teased out, that there's no chance that they're going to succeed into the future. Um, and then your question of co-option, absolutely. I mean, it's absolutely a possibility. Um, but I think that through prefigurative strategy, a movement can resist co-option more than a traditional top-down model. Um, because through prefigurative strat strategy through radical democracy, people learn how to become effective political actors. People learn the, the power of, um, of, of the ethics of horizontalism, or the power of so solidarity, or mutual aid, or whatever ethic uh, that a group you know, tends uh, over time to adopt. Uh, they, they, they know that. Uh, instead of being like a passive recipient of you know, benefits won by a political party. Um, so I think that you know through prefigurative strategy is, is or prefigurative strategy is a great way to resist co-option, um, and some can't participate. That's that's true, but at the same time, uh, the history of consensus in the United States is not just the history of white Quakers. It's not just the history of uh, privileged uh, white people. But um, SNCC, for example, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee um, in the Civil War utilized consensus up until a point. Um, there's a fascinating discussion about why they uh, uh, abandoned consensus um, by David Graeber, who is an uh, anarchist anthropologist in Goldsmiths College in England, um, who was also uh, one of the, the first kind of uh, organizers of Occupy Wall Street, well versed in consensus and direct democracy, uh, claims that consensus is not just a practice of white you know, uh, privilege activists in the United States, but a practice around the globe uh, that you know people in, in Bangladesh, for example, have been utilizing some form of consensus, perhaps, for hundreds of years. Um, so I think that, uh, essentially, there, there are a lot of uh, benefits to be, you know, won from a prefigurative strategy, from radical democracy. Uh, but of course, like any strategy, there's going to be downfalls, there's going to be 
um, you know, uh, points where it's not politically effective to have a consensus meeting for four hours um, with a large group of people, that in fact power moves very quickly, and if you're going to be uh, politically effective, you have to adopt some form of rapid response that, you know, is uh, maybe not violates ethics, but um, at some point has uh, some, uh, you know, elasticity with <clears throat> The gentleman in the blue shirt, did you have something that I sort of yeah, I did. jumped it, in on? It, okay. it follows uh, the theorem I'd actually repeat in some ways the last two questions, but I'll do it in a different way. Um, I just want to ask about the relationship, and again, it's a question uh, for Stephen Paul, about the question, uh, the relationship between crisis and time, the temporality of crisis. So it seems to me that um, there's a double edge to crisis that we need to be careful of. And in one sense, um, you spoke about the need to engage in greater participatory democracy. Of course, that requires time. It requires time to make claims, to judge claims, and all this kind of stuff, about mass and stuff. Um, but of course, crisis tends to call for action. And one of the risks, or I suppose some of the uncertainties about crisis, this is often articulated in terms of catastrophe, I don't know where the line is on catastrophe and crisis. But crisis can be used as an excuse by the executive to take action, to close down democratic spaces. Um, so in terms of the economy, we might talk about the imposition of austerity me measures without debate, because we have to act in order to um, annul the coming crisis. Right. So I wonder whether and this, this floor discussion started with the possibility of a gener the generative possibility of crisis. And I've just been thinking during this, this floor debate, perhaps one of the things we might talk about is where crisis is located. It seems to me that if crisis is located in the imminent future, as a matter of if and when, then it opens itself up to precisely these risks of the executive adoption of crisis in order to advocate certain exceptional measures of the main security. If we move crisis into now, and we say crisis is, is, is already upon us, there is no if, there is no when, because it's already happened, then maybe we start to annul precisely that possibility of the co-option of crisis. It's just an idea, but I think maybe we push it with the idea of temporality and crisis. Yeah. Um, and really quickly, <clears throat> um, it's absolutely an important question. I think I still need some more time to, um, to think about it. Uh, but one way to look at it is uh, that might be helpful is this idea that there is a paradox, um, you know, because uh, you know during a state of crisis it is going to force people to move, um, and uh, perhaps it could open up you know more possibilities. Um, at the same time, um, uh, so so that's one side of it. But then the, the other side of this paradox is that during states of uh, periods of crisis. Um, Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, D during periods of non-crisis, it's hard to motivate people, right? Um, but I don't know, there, there, there's a really interesting dynamic there, and, and I think it's a, it's a tension in the conversation that like, keeps me there, or needs to keep that. Well, I think that we're about at time, so thank you for uh, devoting your time to and audience for a very journey and conversation and a wonderful beginning to the conference.